with history stubbornly refusing, as it does, to take place anywhere else than the past, and time being apparently the fire in which we burn, the writers of Star Trek have had to show a degree of sci-fi inventiveness in order for any historical figure to appear in person. Alien illusions, ancient immortals, enraging entities, time travel, and the holodeck to the rescue. And so with that in mind, I'm Ellie with Trek Culture, here with 10 historical figures that appeared in Star Trek. Number 10, Sigmund Freud. Sigmund, it's probably phallic Freud, has only ever made one physical appearance in Star Trek, in holographic form in the Next Generation episode Phantasms. Data's having some funky dreams, yep, he can do that, and so he does the logical thing and goes to seek advice from the simulation of a psychoanalyst who died over 400 years ago. Of course, Data is polymorphously perverse, sexually frustrated, hates his father, wants to possess his mother, and his id is battling it out with his ego. Classic Sigmund. Almost a full house on the Freud bingo. Turns out, it was all interphasic alien organisms which had been sucking the life out of the crew and ship systems. Data's positronic subprocessor, his unconscious if you will, detected the high frequency interphasic signatures from the creatures, which his dream program then represented in symbolic form. Clear? The real Freud would have a field day. Oh and by the way, anyone for some Troy-shaped cellular peptide cake? Worf says it's delicious. Aside from these oniric escapes, Freud only gets a mention by name in two other episodes in Star Trek over the years. Captain J Janeway brings him up in Voyager's concerning flight, and Dr. Crusher hypothesises about a supposed meeting between Freud and Gertrude Stein on the Orient Express in the Next Generation episode Emergence. In the Discovery episode Sue Carl, Sylvia Tilly does also quip to Osira that a certain 19th century neurologist would say that you've just proven the idea of projection. Number 9. Abraham Lincoln Widely ranking top as America's favourite president, and given his noteworthy life and fateful death, it is little surprise that Abraham Abraham Lincoln appears quite extensively in Star Trek. We encounter Lincoln most notably in the original series third season episode The Savage Curtain. He is recreated from the thoughts of the crew of the Enterprise by the Excalbians in order to go toe to toe or rock to rock with the likes of Genghis Khan, Kalis, Zora of Tiburon and Colonel Philip Green. Kirk and Spock also have Serac on their side though. Interestingly enough, this is the introduction to the franchise for Kalis, Serac and Green, who we would later see in various series down the line. The role of Lincoln was meant to go to Mark Leonard of Sarek and Romulan Commander fame, but he was unavailable. Lincoln reappears in later iterations of Trek, for example, the short Treks, but most memorably no doubt in the Lower Decks Season 2 episode Kayshon, His Eyes Open. There he is on display aboard a collector's guild ship in Excalbian form, although now reduced to a skeleton with the spear that killed him still pointing out of his back. Number 8. Former Flints Flint, presumably he got sick of choosing longer names, is an exceptional case when it comes to historical figures in Star Trek. Gifted or cursed, depending on your point of view, with instant tissue regeneration, Flint was immortal and had lived for thousands of years before the Enterprise caught up with him in the original series episode Requiem for Methuselah. Over the millennia, he had assumed a vast number of identities. He became some of the most noteworthy people in history. As the episode states, Flint was Methuselah, King Solomon, Alexander the Great, Lazarus, Merlin, Leonardo da Vinci, Johannes Brahms, and might have been Reginald Pollock, Melozzo de Forli, and Shakespeare. Or he might have just nabbed a first folio. He claimed to have met Moses, Socrates, and Galileo, and not content with that, in the first draft of the script, he would have been Jesus, Picasso, and Beethoven. Flint's quest for a love eternal led to a jealous showdown with Kirk, a broken android, and some serious starship shrinkage. In the end, Dr. McCoy discovered that, having left Earth, Flint had lost his immortality and was showing signs of aging. For a man and who probably had the largest impact on Earth history of any singular human being, Flint is never mentioned again in Star Trek canon, aside from an oblique reference by Captain Janeway in the Voyager episode concerning flight to Kirk claiming to have met Da Vinci. Number 7. Gandhi, Lord Byron, Socrates and Marie Curie Gandhi, Byron and Socrates all appeared as holograms in the Star Trek Voyager season 3 episode Darkling, although if they could they'd probably wish they hadn't, as it doesn't end well for them. The latter looks more like a windsock than Socrates when EMH Mark Evil is done with them. In the episode, the Doctor is leafing through the historical figure's database
database to find potential personality traits to nab for his own subroutines. All that meddling with his program has an unfortunate side effect as a dark hide like character forms, mad, bad, and dangerous to deactivate. Both Gandhi and Byron have dialogue in the episode, however, the world's most famous non violent revolutionary, father of a nation, and one of the world's most celebrated English poets might have been better served than by a debate on the necessity of sexual abstinence versus the more Epicurean approach. We also find Socrates playing a game of Calto against Tapau, the Vulcan, not the band. Marie Curie, the pioneering scientist who discovered the elements polonium and radium, double Nobel Prize laureate, the first woman to ever win one, the first person to win two, and the only person to win one in two separate scientific fields, only gets a simple shout out by the doctor. She does have a shuttlecraft named after her on the Enterprise D though, so swings and roundabouts I guess. Number 6. Jack the Ripper Let us first remember that with the Ripper case, we are talking about the brutal killings of at least five women with real lives, real hopes, and the very real right to our respect. The original series episode is already problematic enough in its attitudes towards women for us to forget this fact. Many, many have claimed over the years to know the identity of Jack the Ripper, but as Philip Sugden, who wrote the book on the matter, The Complete History of Jack the Ripper, states, it is exceedingly unlikely that the murderer will be unmasked now. Well, that was of course until the 23rd century. A boon or a blunder to all the Ripperologists out there, the mystery of Whitechapel's most infamous serial killer was definitely solved in the original series episode, Wolf in the Fold. As the episode opens, Scotty is having some time off to get his rocks off on the completely hedonistic Argelius 2, because as McCoy notes, one error caused by a female crew member has led him to resent all women. What? And you thought Freud gave out some dodgy diagnoses. Scott soon becomes the main suspect in a series of murders of which he claims to have no memory. He is caught each time with bloody knife in hand. Long story short, an investigation finds that an entity which feeds on fear is the real culprit. Now calling itself Red Jack, but having also been Jack the Ripper and other serial killers in the past, it had taken control of the body of Argelius' chief city administrator to commit the crimes. Eventually, the life form is beamed into space in a billion little pieces, and everyone has a good old laugh, still high off that tranquilizer. Later, in the Next Generation episode Relics, Scotty refers to the whole incident as a wee bit of trouble. Number 5. Mark Twain Samuel Clemens, or Mark Twain, known for his interest in science and technology as well as his love-hate relationship with humanity, appears in the Next Generation episodes Time's Arrow Part 1 and 2. In Part 2, the character of Twain makes reference to his novel A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, a precursor of the time travel genre, the plot of which the Next Generation episodes replicate and reverse somewhat by having the future come to the 19th century and then Twain visit the 24th. Jerry Hardin, who played Clements, was so enamoured with the role that he taught his own one-man show about the author for years. Clemens' work is mentioned further in episodes of Voyager such as Spirit Folk and various characters across the series and films, Picard, Cassidy, Yates and the Doctor in Seven of Nine's body, paraphrase what is already a slight misquote of the author. The reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. Twain in fact said as he was originally cited in the New York Journal of 1897, the report of my death was an exaggeration. Clemens is not the only renowned American writer to appear in Time's Arrow. Jack London, real name John Griffith Cheney, probably best known for his novel The Call of the Wild, also features as the inquisitive bellboy who obtains all sorts of items for data. Number 4. Leonardo da Vinci Leonardo da Vinci, who, as discussed earlier, was one of the many incarnations of Flint, also notably appeared in the form of photons and force fields in two episodes of Star Trek Voyager. His workshop and his name are made use of in several others such as Scientific Method and The Raven. Da Vinci himself needs a little introduction, a renaissance man both literally and figuratively. He was an artist, scientist and inventor, whose work transcended the epoch and continues to amaze and inspire today. Da Vinci's first appearance in Voyager was in the season 3 cliffhanger Scorpion Part 1, in which he played muse to a Borg beleaguered Captain Janeway. The writing's almost literally on the wall for Voyager until Janeway sees the light. What if she made a deal with the devil? Kate Mulgrew was reportedly involved in introducing the character to the show as confidant for Janeway, and was pleased with how the scenes played out with actor John Rhys Davis, who was hired to play Da Vinci without an audition. He would reprise the role in the Voyager episode Concerning Flight, in which the Da Vinci holoprogram, having been stolen along the Doctor's mobile emitter, must attempt to make sense of an alien world. The next time we see Da Vinci in the flesh, so to speak, on Star Trek is at the very end of the Lower Deck Season 1 episode Crisis Point, as he shoots Vindicta, not today, not on Da Vinci's watch. Words to live by, really. Number 3. Amelia Earhart Who's Amelia Earhart? says Harry Kim. I suppose we can forgive the young ensign for not having heard of 
of one of the most famous human beings of the 20th century, if not of all time. That was Ancient Earth, as they put it in The 37s, the episode in which Earhart and her navigator Fred Noonan, along with some other alien abductees, are discovered in cryostasis on a planet in the Delta Quadrant. The mystery surrounding Earhart's disappearance persists in the 21st century, the interest in which can often overshadow her historic achievements in aviation and trailblazing work for gender equality. Earhart was an icon in her own time, having become the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic in 1932, and the first person to fly solo from Honolulu to Oakland in California, breaking numerous speed and distance records throughout her illustrious career. It was during an attempt to fly around the world in 1937 that Earhart and Noonan disappeared. As part of the last leg of their journey, the pair took off from New Guinea and were headed to Howland Island in the Central Pacific Ocean. On approach, Earhart radioed to report that the plane was running low on fuel, but contact was lost. The largest search and rescue in US history to date was launched, but no trace of the aircraft or its occupants were ever found. Theories abound about the disappearance, some of which are pure conspiracy, such as the possibility of an emergency landing on another nearby uninhabited island or capture by Japanese forces. Sadly, however, and far from aliens or espionage, the most widely accepted explanation is the one that Tom Paris hangs a lantern on in the Voyager episode. Earhart and Noonan ran out of fuel, died whilst ditching at sea, and then their plane sank to the depths of the ocean. Footage of Earhart is also shown in the opening credits of Star Trek Enterprise, and both a starbase and starship have been named after her. Number 2. Neil Armstrong The very last episode of the original series aired just six weeks before Neil Armstrong took that first step onto the moon. He is only seen on screen twice in Star Trek. The first is in footage of him walking to the Apollo 11 launch pad in the Enterprise opening credits, although technically that means he appeared in every single episode, aside from perhaps those two in the Mirror Universe. And the second is in Shannon O'Donnell's dream of the one small step moment in the Voyager episode 1159. Armstrong is mentioned in numerous other episodes and has a lunar city and lake as well as a starship named after him by the 24th century. Clearly a fan of the show, Armstrong was keynote speaker at the 2004 Beam Me Up Scotty One Last Time convention in honour of James Doohan, who had just received his star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. In his speech, Armstrong said, I'm hoping for my next command to be given a Federation starship, and when I get that command, I would like to have a crew like Captain James T. Kirk had. Spock and Chekhov and Uhura and Dr. McCoy and Sulu, under one further condition, I am an engineer, and if I get that command, I want a chief engineering officer like Montgomery Scott, because I know Scotty will get the job done and do it right. So, from one old engineer to another, thanks Scotty. A fine tribute to Doohan, who sadly passed away the following year at the age of 85. Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were also offered roles in the fan series Star Trek of Gods and Men. Both wanted to appear but could not because of scheduling conflicts. Number 1. Albert Einstein, Stephen Hawking and Isaac Newton So this list was never intended as a ranking, but this, the most legendary of legendary of appearances, was always going to take the top spot. When Data united three of the greatest scientific minds to have ever graced the Earth on the holodeck in the Next Generation episode Descent, we all lost our poker face. The story behind the cameo is as good as the scene itself. At a screening of the documentary based on A Brief History of Time in 1991, it was Leonard Nimoy who introduced Professor Hawking to the stage. Nimoy learned that Hawking was a big fan of Star Trek and a tour of the Next Generation set was arranged. During the visit, Hawking saw the warp core and remarked, I'm working on that, and got to sit in the captain's chair. Producers also learned that Hawking was keen to appear on the show and so offered him the opportunity to do just that. On the DVD special features of The Next Generation Season 6, Brent Spiner, who also cites the poker scene as maybe my favourite moment of the entire experience of doing Star Trek, recounts his second encounter with the physics genius about a year later. Hawking simply asked with trademark humour, where's my money? Hawking's association with Star Trek did not end there. He went on to write the foreword to Lawrence Krauss's 1995 book The Physics of Star Trek, and along with his cameos on TV shows such as The Simpsons and Futurama, he also referenced his Star Trek role during one of his many appearances on The Big Bang Theory. This wasn't the only time that Einstein and Newton made an appearance in Star Trek either. The former also features in the Next Generation episode The Nth Degree, in which he is bested by Barclay. The latter is finger snapped into the future by Q as a witness to Q's impact on history in the Voyager episode Death Wish. Peter Dennis, who portrayed Newton in that Voyager episode, would later go on to play Admiral Hendricks, the officer who gave the crew of Voyager their first official mission in seven years. And that concludes our list. If you think we missed any, then do let us know in the comments below. And while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe and tap that notification bell so you never miss a Trek Culture video ever again. Also head over to Twitter and Instagram to follow us there. 
and I can be found across various social medias just by searching Ellie Little Child. I've been Ellie with Trek Culture. I hope you have a wonderful day and remember to boldly go where no one has gone before.